talk about the difference between effectiveness, efficacy, and efficiency, as those are different terms that kind of get thrown around as synonyms. Uh, we'll talk about attack itself and how to apply it, as well as how to measure yourselves against attack. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the frameworks you can use that help facilitate this process. And just be aware, all these things are kind of like moving targets. So as they evolve, our understanding of how to measure these things will also evolve. Um, this is us, uh, myself, my name is Devon Kerr. Uh, I'm a principal uh, researcher at Endgame. My focus is really on detection and response technology. And before that, I spent about seven years doing incident response for Mandiant and FireEye. So I'm trying to bring as much of that knowledge into this presentation as possible. Uh, and this is my colleague, Roberto. All right, thank you very much, Devin. My name is Roberto Rodriguez. Um, I'm part of the adversary detection team, uh, Spectre Ops. And also, I'm the author of a few open source projects that I recommend just to, you know, check them out and, you know, give me some feedback, um, such as the 300 playbook, the Hunting Elk, the Invoke Attack API, actually to uh, play with the data from, uh, you know, from MITRE ATT&CK and start getting some great stats. And something that I'm releasing today is actually open source security um, event metadata. I was trying to come up with a, you know, clever name. <laughs> My wife didn't like it at the beginning. She said, I don't think that sounds good. I was like, all right. All right, and so that's basically going to focus a lot into providing some structure to your data. And I'm, this is just a work in progress. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to get as much information from the logs that I collect. That is more than 380, I think, like logs from uh, Windows event. Uh, yeah, Windows event logs, you know, uh, there's actually some new even like um, attributes to logs that are just, you know, got released last year and things like that, you know, with Windows 10 in 2016. So I'm trying just to gather as much as I can and try to just to give also some type of like standard, like a schema that we can use to start using things on your SIM. Um, and then I'm just a former uh, senior threat hunter for Capital One. Actually, you know, happy to see some of the people from Capital One in here. Um, just go to the next one. So why this talk? And I think that um, I've seen actually, you know, people talking about quantifying your hunt. And this is great. I've seen some great presentations recently, a couple of days ago as well, and uh, last year. But then with today's keynote, it actually aligns perfectly what we're trying to do in here, which is like we have to understand exactly what we have and assess exactly what we pretty much can utilize to start actually um, you know, going against these different you know, techniques and things like that. And we can just go to the next one. And that also brings me to start talking about what are the things that I'm still seeing um, Hunt teams is struggling with. And I think that this comes down into try to provide this you know, transparent way to show you weaknesses, to show you strengths. Um, a lot of people are trying just to you know, do a check and say, yes, I can detect this. Uh, so that means that I'm blue or, or green and things like that. I cannot detect this and this is red. That's not, in my opinion, the way how you should be doing it because you have to back up that information. You have to support actually why you want to give that scoring capability. So that's huge for, you know, for teams right now. I see also attack, of course, becoming the standard. And I'm seeing a couple of teams also struggling with actually uh, implementing attack. And I think Devin is going to talk a little bit about what actually attack is. And then at the end, of course, you know, I've seen also other teams that they don't even know where to start. And there's nothing wrong with that. Because even though you know, we've been hunting for years, right? The concept of having your own team, your own methodology, that's technically new. So it's pretty good to start now approaching it also with a different, um, you know, way that we're going to show you today. And then uh, when we start talking about effective hunting, actually, that's a term that I liked, actually, you know, when I start, you know, sharing a couple of blog posts and things like that. But I will move to the next one. Basically, anything is effective threat hunting over there, right? If you put a name in there, a product, or just any technique that you use, it sounds badass. But actually, what does that actually mean, right? And then after uh, talking a little bit with actually Cyber Panda, that's actually my brother, by the way, those that know about it. We started actually defining a couple of terms, and these terms like um, efficiency and efficacy started kind of like you know arising from that conversation. And then I started realizing, you know what? It makes sense. We all focus on the efficacy. I want to detect it. I want to go. I want to just get to it. But how are we actually doing it? So we are not actually focusing too much on the efficient part of what actually makes the word effectiveness. And this is what we're going to be focusing today. And then when we start kind of like moving towards talking about efficiency and efficacy, kind of like map to a you know, hunting program or a conversation about detection, that's when you start actually um, understanding that you have to be aligning your defenses to with a threat model. You have to be efficient in order to know exactly what you're going to be defending against. You have to be focusing a lot on the data that you have, right? Is this the right data? Is my tool just giving me the data and I'm just going to find evil? 
So you have to start actually understanding if you actually do have the right data, and also if you have the right people skills, if you have also um, the right technology and things like that. And when we come down to efficacy, then that starts making more sense to me, because then I can actually support what is it that I'm trying to do. So we talked a lot about uh, definitions, but we really haven't talked about where do you begin this process. And uh, it kind of begs the question, when are we going to start? It's going to be a little bit, because before we talk about where we went with this approach, uh, we really have to look at some of the history that's already been established. And Roberto is responsible for some of this. Uh, earlier last year, uh, he introduced a blog post about how hot is your hunt team, which quantified how teams detect and respond, which is you know taking into account the human factor and attempting to quantify that in a realistic way. Uh, as well as a more recent blog post on uh, data quality, and that data quality assessment is is extremely important. And something that I was, you know, just trying to share because I've had a lot of conversations with people in the industry. You know, great talks actually. Um, yeah, but something that I want to just emphasize with these two blog posts is that. I also asked that question to myself, you know, where do I start? And, and, and the first one pretty much reflects my first kind of like answer to it and say, why don't we just visualize this in a way that it would be easier to also share with others that are not probably as technical. And the second one was kind of like, start moving beyond just talking about data availability, which pretty much we do, this tool gives me this data, so I'm good, right? So we're trying to go beyond that trying to assess the data that we get so then we can start mapping it with uh, analytics and things like that. Something we're going to cover, uh, you know, definitely this presentation. Yeah, I promise we're definitely going to get to that, but we're not going to get to it quite yet. So first we have to introduce enterprise attack uh, and of course choosing an adversary model. Uh, I like the way that MITRE put this because a lot of folks approach attack and they think it's a process, they think it's a thing that's just ready to be digested and it's not. It's a knowledge base. It's a really great knowledge base. In fact, I think it's the best available knowledge base of its kind. Um, and what it does is it gives you resources. So we thought we'd give you some notions of why we like it as a model. Well, first, it's threat agnostic. And even though you can cross-reference some of this information by threat group, it talks about these techniques discreetly. And when you look at detections, do you care if it's a nation state using PS exec or you know, an insider who is abusing those controls? Well, to a degree, you do as a business. But from purposes of developing analytics, you probably don't care who the threat is. Um, it contains more than 200 techniques that are categorized into 11 different types of motivations. And of course, includes reference reference materials, which means if you have analysts who don't understand these techniques, it provides the material to educate them. It also includes reference materials that are outside of MITRE, so you can follow those links, read published reports. Some of those are going to describe specific applications of those techniques, while others might give you a more generic methodology, either from an offensive or defensive perspective. And again, cross-referenced by uh, threat groups, if that's your thing. I don't put a lot of stock in that, but some folks really care, and we don't, we don't really differentiate between those use cases in this, uh, in this presentation. To give you an idea of what a technique looks like, here we've got an example uh, of just one type of technique, and you can see it's got um, some tactics which describe motivation, tells you the OS, gives you uh, the data sources. These are the places where you need visibility to detect it. Not always every data source, but there will be evidence in one or more of these uh, for the technique. And of course, uh, at the bottom of this, uh, you will have links to various presentations which are, are helpful. Um, by the numbers, 219 as of the April release, and so they added uh, several techniques. Uh, and they just had a tweet earlier today about where those changes were. Um, and of course, um, this gives you just a little bit of information. What's kind of interesting about this is 68 threat groups are associated with these techniques, 39 contributors, and that includes external contributors. So people in the community developing this material and sharing it with the rest of us. So that's one of the reasons we think it's, it's really valuable. Um, now that we've talked about techniques, you might think, oh, okay, cool. I can go and look at a technique and we can just get started. Uh, I, wish, I wish we could. Um, we really have to look at what pieces of this we can measure if we intend to measure against it. Um, so um, in the subsequent section, we're going to really talk about our analysis of attack. We analyzed attack to understand where to start. Um, the sources of evidence, data objects and attributes, moving towards a notion of like a common data model or a universal Rosetta Stone for these data objects, um, timeliness of data, data quality and consistency, and of course, we're finally going to get to guidelines for building analytics, which I think is the part most people are very excited about. All right, and then when we start talking about understanding exactly what you have, right? 
Um, I don't know if you guys actually knew, um, probably, you know, raise your hand if you knew uh, there was actually a Miter Attack API site. So you can actually go into and start getting more into the specific relationships between each part of each technique, for example. And that's how I started actually thinking about uh, the whole data of Miter Attack, which is like, what can I start now using is, and to start mapping it directly to something that I do have in my environment. And I love graph modeling. Um, and I just started putting together a couple of connections based on also the attributes and the relationships of each specific um, data field in this uh, information per technique. So then we can start actually mapping platforms to tactics, techniques, but something that I actually have not seen doing, uh, people doing much is actually they mapping it to data sources. And I think that that's pretty much where we started actually thinking what is the smallest element that is actually shared among all these other techniques. And we started actually, you know, finding all these uh, different data sources. We actually uh, started, you know, going through the numbers, actually 48, right, that's what we said? 48 data sources, and you can actually go through the slides once we, um, you know, post them, and you can see exactly what's going on. But then the next step to me was actually now understanding um, how can we actually start mapping each data source and how many techniques I'm actually hitting. And I think that that's pretty much what where I started seeing the value. When I seen if you really want to talk about data sources and even tools, the first step I want to know exactly what I'm covering. I know that we want to jump into all these crazy, nice, and awesome analytics, right? That you want to build and you want to detect evil. But then at the end, I guess that this is speaks for, uh, for itself, where you can actually start at least focusing. Now, I understand that there are different names here for the data sources, and some of them actually are more related into just, you know, try to look into your alerts, for example. Like if you go through all these different data sources, you will find some words that, in my opinion, don't align directly to a tool, but this is a good start. And you can actually go through all of them and you can see once again those uh, you know metrics. So once again, you know, we don't just need data, right? But we need the right data. And that's when I actually went back to the data sources and I started seeing some of them. I said, you know what? I'm finding some relationships among these data sources. Once again, MITRE Attack gives you this information, but they don't tell you exactly what should be you should be looking for exactly in your environment. And I think that once again, going back to the uh, keynote today is that you do have a lot of data and you have to understand exactly what you're collecting in order for you to actually start using, in my opinion, the matter attack framework. So we go from those two and then um, pretty much I just started thinking about what is it that I'm looking for when I talk about process monitoring and process command line, that aligns perfectly with a process, what, you know, which we will start calling a process object because as object programming, you have an object and properties. So in this case, it would be a process with the attributes that I believe is what I need in order to start uh, mapping things to these data sources. And then after that, it's pretty much where I started thinking more into, all right, I'm gonna start creating my own data objects with my own attributes. I need a data model. And a data model basically is gonna allow you to um, define the structure of your data in relationships in your data. MITRE actually started a great uh, project with the car analytics and they do have their own data model. They actually started doing it from information from Cybox, which then migrated, I think, to be part of Oasis. I think that that's what you said in English and in Spanish would be Oasis. Uh, <laughs> but then you start actually now thinking that there is some type of relationships that I can find with this model. And that's when I also started also building my own stuff based on the information that I had. And without even looking into the, into the relationships, I started looking that, for example, like in these three objects, I do have a process attribute. So without even like reading much about what could be related, I can start then finding things that might be useful also, not just for hunting, but for incident response. Like what can I start using uh, to start pivoting from my data? And then I went to, of course, if you go to that link, uh, it's actually the legacy website still from Sticks Project, and that actually defines all the different object relationships and things like that. It does have a lot of uh, relationships, so I encourage you to also build your own ones and make sure that makes sense to the data that you have. And then, um, you go to the next one. So then what I did is I just went back again to my data sources and started to start testing this first idea and approach. I picked process use of network, and then I start actually now uh, thinking what that actually looks like. And of course, makes sense, process, right? Connecting probably to an IP, connecting to, to a URL, to a website. So then if you go back to the next one, um, then I start just aligning my process objects and then it started creating these connections. Once again, I love to connect things. So from a graph modeling perspective, it makes sense. 
And then from there I say, okay, now I feel more comfortable saying exactly what I need from the tools that I have in my environment. Let's say Sysmon. If I use the process uh, uh, Sysmon event ID one, I can start mapping what is it that I need from a process object perspective and what I have. So with that, I started thinking about how complete is my data now? And then if you go to the next one, 4688 also gives me information about a process. But something that I started realizing then is that I do have these two tools, right? Free stuff. But then I realized that, for example, Windows Security 4688 doesn't give me a hash. But Sysmon does give me a hash. So I start actually now defining what is it that I need, what is it that I have, what's complete, and what actually might complement each other because information that 4688 provides might be information that I will need also probably when I start um, using Sysmon as well. So with this first, uh, I would say, basic approach, I start now thinking about what is it that I can measure with what I have in my environment from a data perspective. Yeah, so we've, this has been really dense. I know we covered a lot of stuff really quickly. Hopefully everybody feels like these are some commonly understood terms for uh, data analysis. What's kind of important about linking your sensors to data objects is not all sensors are created equal. Um, some are designed to be tamper-proof while others are easily hijacked. And so you want to be aware of that because that availability is going to be something that becomes important later. We're just talking about getting the, uh, the primitives defined. So uh, we talked about a lot of stuff. Uh, what can I measure? Can I finally start writing techniques, please? Uh, we kind of have to talk about what type of data we have and what we want to do with it. Um, we're approaching this from the perspective of hunting. Hunting is a blanket term. My perspective on hunting is that it is just one of many forms of detection. It is not a special workflow. We detect and then we deal with the things that we've detected. So from a hunt perspective, which is just one form of detection, we could look at stuff like, well, I know I need some amount of data. Do I have the data that I need in general to begin this process based on those attack data sources? Then I could say, break it down further if those apply to a specific part of my fleet. Do I have 100% of those data sources on 100% of my Windows endpoints or on 100% of the Windows endpoint archetypes like servers, workstations, et cetera, that I've defined? Yes or no? Um, this helps us to understand where we're going when we start developing analytics. Um, we can ask questions about whether we have uh, visibility in the environment based on just things like retention. If I have an SLA, an internal SLA, that I will provide detections within, say, a 30-day interval, and I only have two days worth of data, well, I'm going to be completely unable to address that requirement. And this gets a little bit into like the hazy area between authority and responsibility. We want to make sure that we have the data because that's part of the way we measure. We don't want to measure based on can we just do it if we catch it within 24 hours because that's not the cycle we work on. We have to know if that SLA is 30 days, we can cover 30 days. And we have to not give ourselves credit we haven't earned. Um, and similarly, we have to look at things like uh, talent. And talent's a subject we're not really going to spend a lot of time on in this talk, but we do promise eventually we will come back to it in a different presentation. Um, and of course, data consistency, which we'll define uh, shortly. Data consistency from multiple sensors, whether those are uh, built into the operating system, EDR tools, whatever we deploy, we have to understand the data that those sensors produce. And we have to use the data model to assess that. Um, so not all of these data sources are created equal. We saw this kind of in the Sysmon versus uh, detailed process auditing example. Um, you are not going to be able to get these answers if you're using some commercial tools. What I encourage you to do is work with your vendors. Your vendors know this. They have schemas which define all of these things. Make sure you work with them to get those answers. Don't try and assess it independently. Um, that will be a very long and frustrating process. Um, now, Roberto borrowed this quote in his blog post on data quality, but I think it really establishes what data quality means in this category. Um, data are of high quality if they are fit for their intended uses in operations, decision making, and planning. If you are unable to plan a hunt that is within that bounded period of time with the data quality that you expect, then your data is, is not sufficient to the task. And then you have to work towards that goal. So each one of these barriers that you encounter is a goal to work towards, and it sets a pretty clear objective. 
Um, now, to give you a standard for data quality, the Department of Defense has this wonderful table that gives you uh, the six properties for assessing data quality. Now, two things I like about this is I agree with all the quality uh, descriptors. All the attributes that are described here make sense from a hunt perspective. The other thing I like is the example metrics are all provided in percentages. Because even though this is a quantitative methodology, it allows us to give relative quantities for some of these values. So it's not simply thumbs up, thumb, thumbs down absolutes, but it is sliding scales that we can work within. And that's going to be really important once we start thinking about the bigger data quality paradigm. And when you start talking about data quality, also dimensions like the ones that you see in that table before, uh, there are actually some of them that might be a little hard actually to start tackling first. For example, like accuracy, like can you you know go to every single endpoint if you don't have an enterprise solution that would actually tell you, hey, by the way, this data was tampered, and then you say, oh my god, there is actually something tampered in my environment. So certain things might be a little hard. So pretty much what we started doing is actually starting focusing on things that are actually feasible right away, actionable, something that you can go back and start doing in your organization. So pretty much took those three data dimensions, uh, completeness, timeliness, and data consistency. And then pretty much we started defining how can that align now with our conversations about even starting a hunt engagement. And the first one, from a data completeness perspective, that's where your coverage comes into place. Because now I do have all the data in my SIM, in my ELK, or anything, or your Splunk instance. Um, but now I want to know how complete that data is, because now I want to start actually understanding the coverage in my environment from a platform perspective, tool perspective, and things like that. Second concept, then, it starts getting, if you go back to the other one, second concept is start actually now focusing still data completeness, but with the example that I was showing you before with Sysmon and also uh, Security Log 688, where you can actually now start seeing how complete is that data that I'm working with based on these data structure that you define for your organization. Next one, consistency. And this is what I see in every single organization that I go. You might have so much data. You can tell me, hey, you're going to have so much fun once you get to my environment because you can hunt, you can do this and that. And when I get there, I'm like, I have to write a query that touches 20 different field names to just point and kind of like get information from one value. So that to me is so inefficient because that is, it's, it's pretty much, you cannot just have somebody in your SOC or in your hunt team um, trying just to say and touch every single data source. By the way, nothing is consistent, so you have to hit every single data field, um, you know, naming convention that the company that you are using actually uses. So I think that that's really inefficient. And we're going to show you later how that actually impacts your hunt. In the next one, we talk about, you can go to the next one as well, uh, we talk about data timeliness. And this one, um, the way how it's defined is you have to actually show how current your data is, right? But at the same time, this aligns uh, with the data retention piece. So important. We're going to show an example later, but this is basically going to focus into um, is my data getting to my uh, to my elk or my Splunk or anything? Is it getting into a timely fashion that I could actually say, yes, I'm detecting it first in real time? Now, that might not be as um, important probably for you. But then from a data retention perspective, then it comes into like, if I'm going to do a hunt, how far back can I actually hunt for this? Critical, especially when you have requests by either uh, you know policies in your company, standards, or your senior literature. So that's also something that you have to consider. And then, um, and then from there, this is a good reference basic uh, page that you can actually then kind of like go through all these different points, uh, summarizing what we are trying to approach, um, you know, how we're trying to approach the measurement of a hunt with attack. So if you look at data, if you specifically look at the data in enterprise attack based on all these criteria, you wind up with a heat map that's a little bit more complex than just uh, green checks and red X's. In fact, what you're expressing here is both fleet coverage, coverage within a fleet based on operating system, data availability, timeliness, the quality of that data, how well that data matches up to an expected standard. And we're not sharing the legend for this, um, this kaleidoscope of colors, uh, but be aware that this is the level of depth you want before you start planning to hunt for a specific technique because this informs your success don't start a hunt for a technique without any idea of where you're going to go. You might walk out the gate and find out, oh, well, we've been uh, required to go look for port monitors as a form of persistence, and we have zero visibility into the registry of those endpoints. We just don't have it. 
So before you even begin, you know you will fail. You know that you will have to change and transform the environment to be successful. And that's why doing this assessment first uh, is very, very helpful. Um, now, um, finally, techniques. Are we going to talk about techniques? This is a tack. It's 200 some techniques. Can we finally get to it? Well, we want to really understand the data quality component first and understand how it influences success and failure. So we've been talking about hunting and general detection, and we wanted to define a couple of guidelines further for operationalizing this process. One is things like keyword searches. If you consider hunting to look for file names or IP addresses or hashes, that should be automated. That is a thing a machine will do uh, error-free, which a human will probably make mistakes with. So automate that part. Still do it but use it as an input to normal alert-based detection. Um, also understand that some techniques are better found in conjunction with other things. Um, MSHTA is a good example of this. Organizations use MSHTA, a native Windows file, to pull down HTA files. Maliciously, these, these might be full with uh, you know, script payloads, but in a benign sense, they are still used, both internal assets as well as external assets. So you might look at that and say, oh, well, we see tons of MSHTA activity. It's talking to some internal IP address. It's pulling down a file. Doesn't look that strange. And then you look at that endpoint, and other techniques are also being recorded within a relatively short time frame. And all of a sudden, you realize, like, oh, yeah, MSHTA was probably benign in the majority of those cases, but now I can cluster it with other things related to this process, like where MSHTA is the parent of Windows script host executables. And all of a sudden, you're realizing, oh, that is not right. Now I need to begin responding to this. Um, we also want to make sure that for folks who look at this as a quantifiable methodology, pro probably don't want to rank techniques on some arbitrary scale of sophistication. The way I'll summarize it is, Everyone uses PSExec equally. If that's the technique you look for within the lateral movement category, and that's all you know, you don't know if that's a nation state, an admin, somebody who just downloaded sysinternal stuff and is just mucking about on the network. We have to treat each one of these as if they are an even level of sophistication. Um, we also want to know which variations exist for a technique, because you can't find a thing you don't know about. Now, this leads me to PowerShell, and PowerShell is my favorite example. Um, PowerShell is one of those cases where a tool is also a technique. PowerShell abuse is incredibly detailed. Um, as most of us have experienced, if you load up that system automation DLL with any other executable, it is essentially PowerShell. It has all the functionality of PowerShell. If you look for PowerShell.exe as a basic process name, you will probably find it, but you will not be guaranteed to find all instances of PowerShell abuse. And this does lead to another example where uh, very recently uh, there was a presentation about converting commandlets from PowerShell into .NET methods. If you are looking for PowerShell abuse and you can't inspect .NET methods, you are probably not fully covering PowerShell abuse as a technique. And that's one of those things where we can go back to attack and reference all those papers to understand every application of the technology. This is a very detailed process, and you probably won't squash a technique 100% on the first try, but it gives you something to work towards. Um, now, we also wanted to share this. This is a tweet from earlier uh, last month, uh, or this month, depending on what month it is. Um, and this, this illustrates a really important point. So if you're going out and looking for threat activity with something that's alert-based, it's going to be tuned for low false positives. It wants to give you true positives. That's what it's designed for. While special purpose hunting platforms are quite the inverse. They need false positives because that's what the hunt methodology is for, to look for both the good and to try and eliminate the stuff that is malicious so we can deal with those threats and get them out of the environment. If you're using the same technology to do both, that will inform your success in this process. A lot of organizations just buy one thing and then they stick with it, but we have to be more sensitive to that as we try and appreciate the success and failure of this approach. And something that I believe uh, you know, is very important to remember, I think that Devin touched on it, which is attack variations. Um, that actually is very important because every time I talk to somebody about measuring your hunt, you know, it comes down into, hey, but I can detect this, so I'm good in here, I can detect this, this, and that. And then it comes down into like, okay, that's one variation of the attack. You cannot just give it 100% if that's just one variation. So measuring those variations 
it's really hard because, for example, I think that, you know, that was mentioned in the keynote, Casey Smith comes with something every day. I mean, at 6 a.m., like, he woke up and he just did something. I'm like, oh, my God, this is a new technique in here. So now I have to uh, kind of, like, readjust my probably metric if I'm saying I'm good if I can detect this uh, specific technique. So that's what I like to approach this from a data perspective. Give me something that can support that. Like, do I have at least the data that kind of start getting me more into um, start building data analytics? actually so when we talk about data analytics it's pretty much now focusing more into first from a behavior perspective MITRE has again right attack based analytics which is gonna actually categorize um, how you can start building and ca uh, you know categorizing how you want to uh, you know just address this detection so we got all the way from behavioral situational awareness and then you can go back probably because we didn't touch that for <laughs> and then the anomaly outlier and of course forensic so that's gonna give you that room to start actually touching different ways how you might detect also this specific technique and not just focusing one query that will give me exactly that specific probably string that I'm looking for. And then at the end, um, of course, you know, this is this is uh, this is slide is gonna be uh, you know, slides we provided to you. So you can go into more details in here. But something that we touched today is basically the data quality piece. As you can see, like, there is actually other uh, pieces in there, such as technology, uh, talent. And we also touched a little bit of detection, which we believe uh, you have to be really careful and start focusing more into what is it that um, I can actually see with my data. OK, so we've talked a whole lot about a lot of stuff. Uh, we've gotten through about almost 70% of our content, so um, I feel pretty good about that. Um, but we're gonna talk about some specific examples because this doesn't become real until you actually start looking at techniques. Um, so generally when we approach a single technique, we wanna build on that data analysis we've already done, right? If we know where those data sources are and our percentage of coverage and our percentage of the fleet, some of these numbers fill themselves in. And so we're, we've already done the legwork. Now we can look at the technique and we say, well, do we have all the data? Do we have the data from all the endpoints we care about? Do we have all the data from the endpoints we care about within that agreed upon interval, whatever that is, whether it's two years, 90 days, 27 minutes, doesn't actually matter. That's, that's gonna be unique to your organization. We also wanna know the timeliness if we ask to do a hunt, we have to have the data. Um, we want to look at the consistency again. Each tool we use, and we can pull this data from multiple data sources. We want to make sure that those tools are formatting the data in a consistent way. And then once we get through this, um, we have to ask questions like, is our team actually capable of assessing this? And if you're running a SOC, you kind of generally know what your analysts are strong with. If one of these data sources involves, say, like packet analysis, and you don't have a person who understands like the TCP packet structure, that might be a barrier to success. Um, not necessarily a complete barrier, but at least a hurdle. Um, and then you can start building analytics, refining them over time, and of course, documenting this whole process, documenting the technique, the analysis steps, uh, false positives, true positives, um, everything that you can do to make sure that these workflows are more efficient and successful. Um, so what do we do to test? Well, you're gonna need a couple things in your environment. Generally speaking, you'll need a place that collects all this data so that we can begin writing analytics against it. Um, we'll probably need a couple of system archetypes, which are gonna be a little different from each other because every organization has different types of systems. Um, we'll need to know what those are, and they'll be part of a representative study. Um, we'll also wanna know that we've got endpoint visibility, enabled by something like maybe Sysmon or OS Query. Whatever you use, just make sure it provides the data you need to address that technique. Um, we approached this presentation as a completely tech agnostic one. We tried to reference uh, open source and free solutions, but if you've got commercial stuff, you still have to go through this process. Um, and again, that's a great place to leverage your vendor. You need to forward those events to that central location. If you're gonna do hunting and the data all resides on the endpoint, that can be a problem. Um, those things are not always tamper-proof. And so for us, the baseline is centralized data that also makes this a much more uh, performant process. Um, and things like network metadata can be very helpful. In fact, some techniques require it. Um, and of course, you'll need a testing framework or maybe a couple of testing frameworks because there's just so darn many of them now. Maybe you want to use multiple testing frameworks and even compare them against each other to see which ones more completely express a technique. And this isn't about which is best, that's what we're going to pick. It's about making sure we can address the technique, analyze the data, and perform detection because that's the role. Um, so 
tools that help with this. There are so many. Um, Red Canary's Atomic Red is another great knowledge base with tons of resources. Um, MITRE wrote Caldera, which does this exact thing. Um, Uber has Meta, Endgame release uh, Red Team Automation. Um, all of these things are a little bit different. They're designed differently, and they cover uh, some of the same in different techniques. But their goal is the same, to provide you with the material you need to detect adversary techniques. And fortunately, most of these don't do anything destructive. They don't add anything to those system archetypes which are bad or, or cause consequences. So using them is generally in your best interest. Um, now, if we take one example, I'll pick on install util because it's a simple one and, and it's one that's relatively easy to get our arms around. Um, let's just say that we've got a fictional organization with a thousand Windows endpoints and nothing else, flat network, um, Sysmon is going to give us hash information, cert information, uh, process metadata, command lines, uh, process use of network, just in case we care about that. And we can see that it only really references process monitoring command line options as data sources. So Sysmon gives us that without any of these other configs, but we might want to use that metadata in a couple other ways. Um, we also might have some NetFlow metadata at the switch level and some egress firewall visibility, just again, for, for completeness's sake. And we want to forward everything to something like HELC, which gives us uh, one place that we can go and we can match against. Um, and of course, once we start looking at the data, um, we have some knowledge of what's available and what's not. And that's when you start actually now then focusing a little bit more exactly into what is it that you have mapped to. What you have defined is the data that you need, the attributes that you're looking for, how complete is the data, and then of course the consistency across probably other you know, sources that you're using in order to start getting into the detection of that technique. And of course, also completeness comes down into, I understand my environment. I know that I'm getting pretty much every single endpoint in my environment. And of course, you know, from a data retention, we uh, at least understand that what is it, how far back we want to hunt in this space. And once again, this, this looks like, hey, you know, like this is easy and stuff like that. But this, this actually is a lot of work to start defining what is it that you need what is it that you have, and it start actually doing some like assets manage, um, assets management also on the left and things like that. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm one of the contributors to Red Team Automation. It's it's written by everyone in my research org, but. Um, install Util is one of the scripts that we offer, uh, specifically for remote file copy. So if we just look at what I did in this script, which is the information on the right, and the data sources that we mapped on the left, I know I have 100% of the stuff I need to write analytics for this technique. And this is the exercise we want to go through. We want to have concrete information. If any one of these was blank, like maybe we have the process name but not the command line, well, then how am I supposed to know it's malicious? Because the command line metadata is essential for this particular data source. Um, and if you look at what this RTA does, um, just really quickly, it sets up a local web server. It's Python based. It takes about a second. It determines the bitness, because that determines which version of install util it will invoke. And there are two for each bitness. It will then run it with a connection to a local web server and pull down a benign ex executable. Um, and that executable is not actually malware. It's just meant to be representative. So now I have a notion of what is happening behind the scenes that an adversary might also need to do. And I have the data sources I need. This is the place where we get a little bit closer to analytics. Now, these are just examples. Um, here we have a behavioral example up front, basically looking for a combination of install util as an original file name, because install util could be uh, trivially renamed. Um, so we'll look for its original file name uh, as parsed from the PE metadata. And we'll look at the command line containing uh, a URL. Like, this might be a thing that's legit in your organization, but you won't know that until you begin developing these behavioral analytics. And we might need to extend this to make it a little bit more tailored. Um, if we want to know uh, the general use of install util from a situational perspective, we'll want to know every use of install util. And we might want to break that down based on common criteria, like which account used it, on which systems, um, what were the destinations that this, thing, that this thing was reaching out to. Um, this helps us to understand what's normal for our environment. And even though these analytics answer different questions, they're both analytics. And you might want to have 
each of these analytics for every technique. Um, you can also develop outlier analytics. Basically, it's the same as other analytics, but you're stacking those, looking for least frequency of occurrence. I would say based on something like the account or more appropriately, the command line, if that's the attribute you're looking for. Um, and then, of course, as a forensic analytic, maybe you know that you've had an intrusion where this technique was used and you have some information about how it was used, you can go look at other systems that had these same artifacts and now you're scoping an intrusion. Each one of these analytics serves a different purpose, but they're all effective and we can measure them in similar ways. And just before, can you go back to the one that you were talking, just before you know, we move to the, now another example, um, it's very important to understand now, you know, we talk about you know, stacking techniques and things like that, but so once again, right, coming down into if we have consistency, then a stacking technique will make sense to me. If I don't have consistency across my data sources, I will have to do some crazy or statements, some like joins, and try to make sure that it fits and I get one list only. So those are actually, you know, real, I would say, examples, and actually that has happened to me. Like I wanted to hunt and then all I get is like this massive query with several different things because I cannot hit everything at once. So then we start, you know, you probably can start thinking, yeah, you know what, I still am not convinced. Uh, I see data quality, but data detection, eh, it doesn't, it doesn't just click right there, right? So let me just give you one example. I woke up actually that day like a 6.45 a.m. I think, and every time I wake up, I just go to Twitter and try to see exactly what's going on. It's like my newspaper. And then I saw this right here. And this is exactly what happens in real world. Right? You go into your organization, for example, uh, yesterday actually at 3 a.m., because uh, I was awake, 3 I don't know why I was awake, but um, and Casey actually released the other one uh, using this specific technique, uh, WMI, which is WMIMICATS or something like that, WMIMICATS, um, especially using this technique. So have fun on Monday, because then somebody will actually ask you to start getting more into this area. So let's say we pick this right here, we get some information, and then if we move to the next one, then your team starts trying to create this crazy analytic. If you have Joe in your team, man, that would be awesome having joined your team. Um, so then with that, pretty much he tells you, you know what, this is a analytic, a behavior analytic, it's not a signature yet because this is, has not been proved that actually can detect it. So that's how we started thinking about, let's think about the behavior first variation. That to me is just one variation of the tag because this can be obfuscated, you can change the name of the executable and things like that. So just looking at this variation then, I can start then go back to my environment and you go next and then you go, oh, the other one, and then you say, oh, all right, couldn't find anything, awesome. That means that that didn't happen, whew. All right, we're good. And then you go back to the, I'm sorry, you go to the next one, then you say, all right, I'm ready to send my email and say, hey man, we're good, don't worry about it. All right, nothing happened, we're all good. Now, I join your team, right? And then, <laughs> and then I say, hey, wait a minute, do we at least know how complete our data is? Like, do we have coverage across everywhere? You might be missing a couple of things. Tell me, please show me that you have completeness of your data. And if you don't have that, of course, you know, you won't be able to see exactly what happened. If you go to the next, then you say, um, uh, can you go back to the other one, I'm sorry? All right, and uh, in this one, then you tell me, because I didn't see the other red lines in here, but in this one, I could now see, you come back to me and say, hey man, I actually do have completeness from a Windows security perspective, so I actually should be able to look into that specific behavior. That's what I'm mapping it to something that might be compromised. And boom, and you still have nothing. And you're like, you see, I prove it to you. And I'm like, hey, wait a minute. Can you look just for WMIC and you know, 4688? I just wanna see what you have. And boom, I just find WMIC right there. And this is like real examples, actually. Uh, if you go to the next one. And then I can just pretty much tell you, okay, this is weird because you were not able to show me anything with WMIC before. Uh, but if you look just for that into one specific log, makes sense. And then you say, hey man, wait a minute. All right, look, I'm gonna show you that it was nothing. The reason why the, the whole query failed is because I couldn't find the command line, but I go, I'm like, okay, dude, come on. Uh, <laughs> the reason why your query or your analytic fail is because you did not have the complete data. You might think that you were failing is because the, the analytic didn't actually match what you were looking for. No, simple, you just didn't have the data. So you don't have complete data. And if you go to the next one, uh, then you tell me, you know what, man, I actually do have complete data, so don't tell me that I don't. Um, I actually have almost 90% of my environment, and then I actually have seven days of data uh, cover, you know, retention in there. And then I say, all right, let's just go for it again. Let's just look for it, and boom, nothing. And then you say, I prove it to you that it's nothing. Seven days were good. And then we go back and say, let's pull some archives, and then, you know, let's go for, you know, 30 days. And then you go to the next one, and the next one. 
and then I can tell you that, okay, this actually happened in your environment. It's just that you just for not paying attention to the basics, I think that um, you know, other talks have actually expressed it enough as well, where it's like you have to understand what you have. And in order for you to understand what you have, you have to go through every single piece of data that you have, and you have to actually start assessing this completeness, this consistency, and here we didn't talk about even consistency. I just proved you that with timeliness and with data completeness, I can actually prove that an analytic that probably you're executing your environment as a hunting engagement is not being efficient. You're trying to focus on efficacy, but you're not actually thinking about the efficiency that is gonna make your hunt uh, campaign or engagement an effective one. Closing thoughts by Jeff. All right, closing thoughts by Jack Handy. Um, so here's the thing, um, as, as much as we love this topic and as much as we like dug into it, we aren't really done. Um, there are a couple of other ways that you could do this, that you could approach it, that are maybe um, get you to the same place in a different time frame. So um, some folks um, care about adversaries and so they might go to an adversary group uh, as cross-referenced by MITRE, and then say, okay, well, I want to, I care about this group. Maybe you're a financial org, you care about Fin7, and you say, show me all those techniques. And I wanted to illustrate why this might be, um, might not be as certain a bet as you think it is. So looking at a group like WinNTI, this is a Chinese-based nation-state threat group. Um, as an incident responder, I responded to this group dozens of times. So I know that the three techniques that are cross-referenced against this group are incomplete. I know they do dozens of things. And I know that they evolved over time to include Tradecraft, which blurs the lines between them and a couple of other threat groups. So if you take this route, how quickly you cover the entire threat matrix of attack is going to be impacted, but it also might not give you the certainty you think it does. And that's an important caveat to give to leadership, not necessarily among yourselves, but you want to make sure that your leadership who is directing you in, down this path understands that these things are only as good as the information behind them. Um, so yeah, you could build out analytics for each one of these techniques, understand which OSs they apply to, and apply a data quality uh, rubric to them like we've suggested, and you will eventually get to a place where you have coverage. All of these techniques are cross-referenced by one or more threat groups, so if you take the adversary-focused approach, you will eventually get there, but we think it'll take a lot longer. Um, a method that we liked a little bit less than that is technique-focused. Instead of doing the data quality assessment, the data availability, piece. Instead, some folks feel like, I just want to pick techniques and then just chip away at them. And I got to tell you, I've dealt with organizations doing this, and I know that it leads to incomplete coverage. It's an inefficient process. But the things to be aware of is, when you choose a technique, then you go through the data quality piece, and you will repeat the data quality assessment for every technique. For every new data source, you're gaining ground, but most orgs are not building out some baseline understanding of what data is available and what the quality is. So it, it takes a longer time, and I think it, it is one of the reasons why people have not developed broad coverage of this particular threat model. Um, and of course, you know, be beginning the process of developing analytics for a single technique does not in any way protect you from other things which you've chosen to, to pass down the road for some later point. Um, so a couple of things that we wanted oh, to revisit. Go ahead, you want to talk about them? Or? Uh, so yeah, we, wanna, we wanted to do another presentation, which picked up a couple of the pieces we didn't have time for, like um, each of those four types of analytics, behavioral, uh, outlier, et cetera. Um, it seemed to us like there's probably some evidence of bias between those analytics and data sources. Now, every one of these threat models, uh, be it attack or something else, has a bias for a certain type of data. Um, attack, as we've shown, has a bias for process-based eventing. Um, that's just a thing to be important if you choose a different threat model, you have to understand the data bias it has, because that's going to inform the sensors, the data objects, et cetera. Um, we thought there was probably a correlation there, and we wanted to explore that. Um, data retention is a function of quality and availability. We wanted to figure out, for some of these data sources, is there a sweet spot? And across all of these data sources, is there an ideal we can point to, which can also be like operationalized by a team of hunters? We thought that would be an important thing to dig into. Um, and of course, uh, talent, the, uh, the great mystery. How do we assess our human factors? And that's something that we thought that we were in a position to assess as both having a lot of experience in that realm. And then, uh, you know, something else I would like to, to add to this, you know, once we start talking about also what are the different, oh man. 
All right, what are the different also data, uh, not data, I'm sorry, hunting models that you could use, like the adversary one or the, you know, per technique? I think that actually that should be called data-driven model, actually, because that would actually will define exactly what you're going to be hunting for uh, at the end. So I think that that's also something to consider. If you have a program where you have different names for the different type of uh, hunting engagements that you have, I would challenge you to probably start also looking into the data-driven model where you actually understand your data and then you start mapping that now you know, with something that we were uh, going to be talking soon is with you know, technology and you know, people and things like that because all those correlate, not just focusing on I can detect this and that's it. So, and with that, at the end, if somebody just wants to go back, actionable items, and you say, you know what, this is too much, man. This, this, this is gonna get a lot because I now have to look into every single event that I have, create my own data objects. Well, I give you top 10, actually, of techniques being used, actually, uh, just pulling statistics from attack. And please, I'm gonna repeat that again. This is attack's uh, knowledge base, right? The database that they have, those are the techniques that they actually uh, define as the most used techniques. From a data source perspective, those are also the top 10. Some of them, of course, you will have to do a one-to-one -one mapping. What I mean with that is that packet capture, you can't just say, I have, complete like, all these data fields that I need. So that's something that you will have to also probably decide how you want to approach that. But most of them, ex especially with process monitoring, file monitoring, process command line, right, right there at the top three, you can actually start uh, providing impact to your organization. That means that process monitoring touched pretty much 149 uh, techniques out of the 280 something, I guess. Yeah, that's 19. <laughs> also, 19, sorry. also important point. So uh, anyone have a wild guess about how many techniques in attack require privilege? like sysadmin or greater, ballpark. So, Jared, you want to guess? Uh, how many require system? Re require uh, non-system privilege. Uh, 116. 116 techniques do not require admin at all, mm -hmm. which means if you are a least privileged organization, this is still really relevant. Um, and then just to wrap up, um, we did want to make sure that you guys had a one-stop shop for all the links that we talked about. Um, we will make the slides available so you will get all these links. And, uh, and we also wanted to thank you. Um, we know we didn't save a lot of time for questions because this was a really... <laughs> this, this slide, we're going to give these out so we don't need pictures. Um, but also, if you want to chat with us, we'll be hanging around and we'd love to engage with people who maybe approach this problem, whether they've succeeded or failed. Yeah, and just one last thing. I think the project is going to be awesome. It's going to be released tonight after a couple of drinks. So I, <laughs> I, I hope that I, you know, pull, uh, push the right uh, PR, I, I think, to, to myself, I guess. Uh, and then that project is going to have some basic information because that, you know, that's a work in progress. So I'm really happy to hear you know, your feedback, if that actually makes sense or not. Thank you very much, everybody.